Let us pray. O oh God, let your word come unto us with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak as only you alone can. And give us the grace that we can hear what your Spirit is saying to us. Thank you, God, for the ways in which you've guided us through this series, Restorer of Broken Walls. Thanks for helping us to identify where there is brokenness, and broken things that need to be repaired, mended, healed, restored. Thank you also that you have given to us the grace and the resources that are needed for us to personally and as a community of faith get involved in restoring, renewing, and rebuilding that which has been broken down. So we ask, O oh God, that in this final message in this series, that you'd speak a word to us. And let this word come forth with clarity, with power, and with grace. That we will feel constrained by the work and the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the life of the church to say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. So let the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. And the people of God say, Amen. My brothers and sisters, in our series, in the book of Nehemiah, Restorer of Broken Walls, we have come to the final message and to the end of the book of Nehemiah. We enter chapter 12. And the people are in a time of worship and celebration. This passage holds the key to the secret of a great testimony for God. In the beginning of the book, we saw that it were, if God burdens our hearts, that God is about to do a great work of honor through us for the good of others. For as we open to the book of Nehemiah, we find Nehemiah having received the news from a relative that Jerusalem lie in ruins and that the walls had been broken down and the gates had been burnt. Nehemiah was crushed by this news. And he became deeply grieved. Nehemiah wept. Nehemiah prayed. And Nehemiah planned. So by the time Nehemiah appeared before the king, and the king noticed that his countenance was that of a man who is deeply distressed in spirit. When the king inquired of him what was wrong, and Nehemiah shared the news that he had received of the state of Jerusalem. 
the king gave him permission to return and to rebuild the walls. In the process of rebuilding the walls, Nehemiah and the people who had a mind to work, who had come alongside him to rebuild the walls, were met with great opposition. The enemy, Sambalat, Tobiah, and others tried every strategy to slow down the work and to bring a halt, an end to the work because the restoration of the walls of Jerusalem did not find favor with Sambalat, Tobiah, and others. And they tried every strategy, including discouragement and the fabrication of lies to bring the work to an end. But Nehemiah continued nonetheless. And finally, the wall was completed. Last week, we reflected on the fact that Nehemiah did not only restore the broken down walls and rebuilt the gates, but he then led the people to restore worship in Jerusalem. The people gathered in front of the sheep gates and the word of God was read by Ezra for six hours. And then the priests and the Levites helped the people to interpret what was read. The people responded with tears, deeply aggrieved because they had moved so far from what the word of God prescribed. And they committed themselves to living in obedience to the will of God. We now come to chapter 12 where Nehemiah is again leading the people in an act of worship, but this time it is a worship, a service of dedication. The walls are now going to be dedicated. I find it interesting, though, that there seems to be at least six to eight weeks between the end of of the rebuilding of the walls and the service of dedication. Nehemiah did not immediately lead the people to dedicate the walls, but instead led the people to restore worship. I suspect that Nehemiah thought, and rightfully so, that to move from the rebuilding of the wall to the dedication of the wall before the people fully understood what worship was about and have a great appreciation of God, they stood the risk of putting their trust and their hope in the wall rather than the God who gave them the strength to rebuild the walls. Maybe Nehemiah recognized that the people were not yet at a place where they can fully appreciate the lordship of God over their lives. And so to rededicate the wall or to dedicate the wall at that time would mean that a wall would become an obstacle in the way of the people and their relationship with God. No doubt you have seen and may have experienced that when God blesses a person who is not spiritually mature, 
that there is always the risk that they can replace the blessing with the God who blesses. And so the thing becomes the object of their worship rather than the God who created and gave the thing. And so we can easily become idol worshippers where the things that God has blessed us with become more important than the God who has blessed us. Jesus one day called several persons to follow him. One person said, yes, I will follow you, but I must first go and bury my father. Another person says, I will follow you, but I've just bought some oxen and I must go and try them out first. And they all came back with a reason why they could not fully commit to God at that time because there was something else that needed to be attended to. Something else became a priority. And so maybe Nehemiah was very much conscious of this. And so before the wall was dedicated... Worship was restored. They were pointed to the God who was, the God who is, and the God who will be. They were pointed to the fact that nothing replaces God. They were pointed to the fact that God must become our priority. And that nothing must stand in between us. And our God, including the things that God has given to us. And so we come now to the dedication of the wall. But may I submit to you something about what it means to dedicate something to God? Dedication is not that we give something to God for God to use. Hear me and hear me well. Dedication doesn't mean that we offer something to God for God to use. But a dedication is the profound awareness that God has given something to us and a vow that we will use it for the purpose that God has given it. When we dedicate something to God, we are not saying, Hey Lord, here is something that comes from our hands that we are going to give to you so that you can use it. No, that's not what a dedication is. When something is dedicated to the Lord, it is the acknowledgement that God has given it to us for a specific purpose and that we thankfully receive it and are committed to use it for the purpose for which God has given it to us. This may not be our understanding of what it means to dedicate something. For example, when this church was dedicated, it was not given to God for God to use, but rather it was an acknowledgement that God has given us this facility for us to use for the purposes for which God gave it to us. When we dedicate something in our lives, it is not that we are giving it to God and say to God, use this for your glory and honor. No, we are receiving it from God, recognizing that all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. And so we receive the gift and we commit ourselves that we will use this gift 
gift that God has given for the purpose and the purpose only for which God has given it to us. And so this is what is happening in this chapter. That the, Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem came together to acknowledge that the wall that had been built was a gift from God to be used for the purposes for which God had given it to them. But more than that, it was a dedication of themselves, recognizing that they were given by God to each other and for each other and for the purposes of God in Jerusalem. And so they were acknowledging the gift and giving thanks to the giver. And so I want us briefly to look at this service of dedication. And this service of dedication has three elements that I want to point to. First of all, when there is true dedication, there will be deep, there will be deep and exuberant worship. When there is true dedication, there will be deep and exuberant worship. Here in Nehemiah chapter 12, we read these words, and the singers sang loudly. And I love that part because I think that has meaning. They did not only sing, they sang with all their strength with all their might. They sang not for themselves, but they sang for the glory of God. They sang because they were witnessing to the power of God over Jerusalem and over the whole earth. They were singing because they were declaring that all the enemies that tried to stop them, that God is more powerful than they are, and that God has triumphed, that God has prevailed, that God has overcome and they wanted the whole world to hear that God is on the throne and so they did not just sing but they sang lifting up their voices to the glory of God you can't read through this passage without seeing the emphasis on music here Go look again at that chapter and notice the number of musical instruments that were employed in this act of worship. They brought in singers and musicians from all over Jerusalem for the express purpose of making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Then they assigned a couple of large choirs whose whole purpose was to give thanks. And I assumed this was also in the form of songs. But what are these people doing? They're not just celebrating. They're not just jubilating. They are dedicating. And in this first point, there are three aspects of deep and exuberant worship that I want to draw to your attention. The first aspect of this deep and exuberant worship is joy. What kind of celebration would any celebration be if the people did not have real joy? It is almost humorous how many people say they are Christians and yet seem to be void of joy. I think the problem is that we have not purified ourselves. So it is hard to be joyful when you are out of fellowship with God. If you're not in relationship with God, then there is no joy. You see, there is a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is as a result of the circumstances of life. Happiness is based on your outer world. 
Happy is, happiness is based on what's happening around you. Joy comes out of your soul. Joy comes out of your relationship with God. Joy is experienced when you can say all, all is well. Joy can be experienced even when there are troubles and turmoils all around us. We can still have joy when we know that God is in control that God is on the throne, that God will order all things well, and that God is in full control of what happens. We can have joy. And so even though everything in my life may not be going the way that I want it to go, I can still come to a place like this, and I can still sing the hymns of the faith with a great sense of joy to the Lord. Because my joy comes from the Lord. My joy comes out of my connection with God. My joy comes knowing that God is holding me up. My joy comes knowing that God is leading me and he knows the way. My joy comes from the knowledge that God is all-knowing and all-powerful and my life is secure in God. And so, Scripture tells us that this dedication service was full of joy. Joy. I hear the song saying, there's a joy, joy, joy down in my soul. Down in my soul, there's a joy. Because the joy comes from God. May I submit to you, you cannot have authentic worship that is not joyful. I, I, I don't care who tells me that, 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 that worship is anything else but joyful. If it is not joyful, then it is not authentic worship. Because even in my tears, there is joy. And notice I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy. And the dedication service was full of joy. Second thing that we notice about this dedication service, this authentic dedication service, was purity. We are told that the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and they purified the gates and they purified the wall. And while there is some element of Washing as a purification rite. This washing was pointing to something deeper than skin level. They were not just washing their dirty hands. They were not just washing their dirty faces. They were availing themselves to the washing that comes through the Holy Spirit. The washing of the heart the washing of the soul, so that they can present to God a pure heart and clean hands, so that they can present to God a heart that has been redeemed from sin, so that they can present to God a heart that has been reconciled to God. And so for Nehemiah and the worshipers, purity was important. Coming to God completely surrendered to the washing by the Holy Spirit. The cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. The blood that makes us clean, purified, and whole. The third thing that we notice about this dedication service, third aspect of this worship, it is full of thanksgiving. God has given them great and manifold blessings in so many ways, guidance, protection, provision, wisdom, and the will to do the work. And how many of these blessings that God has bestowed upon our lives, how many times God has blessed us tenfold, one hundredfold. Do we therefore, as we come into the presence of God, come with hearts of thanksgiving? 
I have been in the space of worship and I've heard people complain throughout the service. Not at James Street, though. Elsewhere. Complain about everything. They complain that the hymns have too many verses. They complain that the prayers are too long. They complain that the ushers are not smiling enough. They complain that the person sitting next to them is singing too loud. They complain that somebody is clapping too hard. They complain that the drum is too loud. They complain, they complain, they complain. And I'm saying that we cannot come into worship with a spirit of complaining. Our worship must be a spirit of thanksgiving. There are so many things that God has done for us for which we need to be thankful, including those little things that we often take for granted. The fact that you are here, the fact that you got here this morning is enough to give thanks to God. Even though there may be troubles in your life, the fact that you are breathing and you're not lying in a hospital bed struggling for your life is reason enough to give thanks. The fact that someone knows your name, the fact that someone cares about you is enough reason to lift up your voice and give thanks to Almighty God. And then the troubles of life begins to fade away because you recognize that there's more reason to give thanks than to complain. And the people came with hearts of thanksgiving as they dedicated the wall and dedicated themselves to God. I am submitting to you that when there is true dedication, there will be deep and exuberant worship. Notice this worship was not surface worship. This worship was not just looking at the order of service and going through the motion. This worship was one where they brought their very self and immersed themselves in the moment where they encountered God in the moment, where they experienced God in the moment, when they were lost in the presence of God in the moment, when God meant all the world to them in that moment. It is that kind of deep and exuberant. And so you got to dig deep and you go high. You dig deep and you go high. That's the worship that honors God. The second thing that I want to show you quickly is that when there is true dedication, there will be sacrifice. Look at verse 43. Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. They offered great sacrifices. Now, this is within the context of the Old Testament sacrificial system where animals were offered as sacrifices, where the blood was spilled, was poured on the altar, where there was atonement for sin, where there were various offerings for different purposes. But sacrificing is not simply an Old Testament concept. Because I hear the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or worship. In other words, Paul is saying, 
You cannot authentically worship God and don't bring anything and don't bring your full self on the altar. So to present your body to God is to surrender your whole self to God. To present your body to God is to say, Lord, I am yours. Everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I have, everything I hope to be, my body, soul, I present it to you. I am your humble servant. You are my Lord. Use me, Lord. Lord, to accomplish your purpose, to bring you honor, to bring your name glory. This is what it means to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It means no holding back. Absolutely no holding back. And you know that we can be in the business of saying, God, I'm going to offer my whole self to you, except I'm not ready to commit this part of my life. Not ready to commit this part of my life to you. Lord, I will offer myself to you completely, except the week of Karpova. Lord, you know I have to fit. I'm ready to sacrifice that yet. Lord, you know I will dedicate my whole life to you, but God, you know that at, at Christmas time, I, 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 I don't come to church during December other than Christmas Day, because I have to prepare this. Lord, I will offer my whole self to you, but God, I, I'm not going to preach. God, I will offer my whole self to you, but God, I know I can sing, but I'm not going to sing in the choir. We hold back. We all do it, don't we? We all begin to negotiate with God. And the moment you begin to negotiate with God, you know you're not in a good place. Because God always wins. God is always right. God knows everything, sees everything. And if God says so, it has to be so. There is no alternative to what God requires. It may mean giving up some things that have had meaning for us over the years. It may mean giving up some things that have been part of the family tradition for many years, but it comes a time when God says, I need you. And if I'm going to get you completely, I need to take you out of this. I need to bring you into this place. I need to bring you into this position. I need to bring you into this disposition. Can you then say, Lord, to your will and to your way? I hear the songwriter saying, all to Jesus. I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Put it in a simple terms. It seems that Paul is saying, don't go through the motion in this worship. Don't go through the motion, but offer up yourself completely to God. Let me say, finally, that when there is true dedication, there will be sharing and extravagant generosity. If you read on from verse 44 to 47, you'd notice that the persons who had gathered for the dedication gave gifts for the continued work of the Lord. The work in the temple and the work in Jerusalem altogether. No doubt the people would have given much for the rebuilding of the wall. They would have given of their resources. They would have given from their worth for the work. But they recognized that uh, the completion of the wall did not mean the end of God's activity in Jerusalem. They recognized that the completion of the wall and the completion of the temple did not mean that God did not have anything else to do in Jerusalem. And so by giving of their gifts, they were acknowledging that the work of God must continue, that the services of God must continue. 
and they had a commitment to supporting those men and women who would be dedicated to carry on the work of God in Jerusalem. And so they gave from their substance. They gave from their wealth. They gave from what they had. They gave and trusting what was given to the managers for the good of all. Now, my brothers and sisters, God has done tremendous things in and through this church over many, many years, centuries, if you may. In every season, God has done a great work. In every generation, God has done a great work. But I submit to you that God ain't finished yet. And I show you that there are some persons who recognize that God is not finished in their generation. And there are some persons who, who sat in these pews, who worshipped here with us, uh, who before they die indicated in their will that this must be left for the church. Money, property, and it was an acknowledgement that the work of God must continue after them. And their recognition that they can contribute to the work of God even when they are no longer breathing, singing, and sitting among us. So I am saying to us that the work of God is not finished in our time. The work of God is not finished in our generation. The work of God is not finished because you have completed the particular task for which God has called you, raised you up, and blessed you. God is going to build on what you have done. God is going to build on the work that you have completed. God is going to continue to build on the vision that God has given to you. And so you can still be a part of what God is going to do in the future. By giving of yourself, your time, and your resources to ensure that that work continues. And so the people did not only dedicate themselves, they shared extravagantly what they were blessed with. We see sharing and extravagant generosity as their response to the dedication. My brothers and sisters, God has shown us that there are brokenness all around us. The walls are broken down. The moral and ethical walls of society are in ruins. A number of spiritual walls that are broken in the church. Many walls are left in disrepair. And God is calling our generation. God is calling us who are alive now. God is calling us who are hearing my voice to be a part of the restoration, the rebuilding, the healing, and the completion of the work to which he has assigned to our generation. God is calling us individually to again commit ourselves. And I know some would say, but Rev, I am old now. And God says, I'm not finished with you yet. And some would say, I am still young. I have my whole life ahead of me. And God would say, I call you while you're strong. It is not about how old we are or how young we are. It's not about how much resources we have or have available. It is about obedience to the God who has a purpose for your life and a purpose for my life. And when the work is done, we must celebrate when the work is being done, we must celebrate as we dedicate ourselves to the work. 
And this is what we see in this passage. And we have a way of not wanting to celebrate progress. Not celebrate those who are part of the work. There are so many persons over the years who have worked hard. And it's important that we don't wait until they've died to then stand here and say what they did and how they, was, how they gave themselves and how important they were to this ministry or that ministry. We must have consistently show appreciation and gratitude for people for their hard work. And today I want to give thanks to God for the men and women who are behind me. I don't see them often because I'm always turning my back to them. But they have offered tremendous yeoman service to this church and to the worship life of the church. And we give thanks to God for the James Street Senior and Junior Choir and for the man and the woman Ryan and Janet, who have been leading them, we give thanks to God for their service and for each time dedicating themselves to being available to be used by God and for God. We give thanks to God for the men and women who have been nurturing our children in Sunday school week after week after week. We do not see them in action, but we see the blossoming of the lives of our youngsters, and we give thanks. And I can go on and on and on of the many men and women daily, weekly, who have given sacrificially of themselves, for which we need to give thanks to God. And sometimes we only miss them when they're not there. You know the old people say you only miss the water when the well runs dry. But I pray that this will not be the reality of James Street Methodist Church, that we will be known as a church that recognizes and celebrates progress. My brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you today, even as I challenge myself to be available to God to find a ministry that you can participate in. As we bring this church here to a close in another couple of weeks, three weeks or so, I pray that if you have not been involved in a ministry during the last year, that you will sign up, that you will show up, that you will avail yourself, that you'd rededicate yourself to be used by God for God. In the choir, in the media team, in the band, the ushers, the stewards, reading scripture. Whatever God has blessed you with, you now need to lay it on the altar. Give it back to God so that God will bless it and use you and use it for the honor and glory of God. Amen.